Hello, everybody. Welcome to Economics with the Honorable David M. Walker. I'm your host and moderator, Nick Palavita. And today we're going to talk about a, a very exciting topic for some people, and this concerns the federal estate tax. Now, most people are not familiar with that because they won't be paying a federal estate tax since they upped the unified credit equivalent to around $23 million. Now, when I first started practice, now this goes back turn of the other century, the federal estate tax exemption was not $23 million. It was around $600,000. And then you started paying estate taxes. Uh, once you pass, when someone passes away and you inherit money, all of a sudden, poof, you get to pay a federal estate tax. You don't get a free pass, uh, you know, on go. So since then, it has changed. The revenues have gone down significantly. Our national debt has gone up significantly, and there's obviously no tie-in. So we're going to be discussing a, a factor that existed years ago that doesn't seem to exist too much today, and that is the federal estate tax. With that, we brought in a panelist, a member who's the Mega Society member, which is the group above Mensa, which no one knows what it is, uh, but we'll bring him in anyway, one of our high IQ people, Rick Rosner. Welcome to the show. Hopefully you have some insights on this federal estate tax to share well, with us. Thing one is only one family in 500 pays estate taxes right now. You right. see one family in 100. Now it's one in 500 because yeah. it was at least doubled under Trump. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, the thing is the unified credit equivalent kept going up. And when actually they eliminated the estate tax in 2001, which is part of the reason you see down here, national pension partners. I'd spent 17 years in the federal, uh, basically working in the estate planning area, but decided to jump out when they said, hey, we're going to eliminate the estate tax. And I was going, well, then I don't have a job because there's no planning to do anymore because there's no estate tax to plan for. And then of course we have the situation that we do today where the exemption is so high. But with that, when I was doing estate planning in Florida back in 1982 to 84, I ran into a book called Marketing to the Affluent because the, that's because back then, if you had more than 1.2 million or 600,000, you were considered affluent yet paid a federal estate tax. And then this book changed. It became The Millionaire Next Door. And with that, we actually have the co author of The Millionaire Next Door, the person that uh, incentivized people to save money uh, rather than just spend it foolishly, the Honorable Bill Danko. Bill, welcome to the show about federal estate tax. You kind of got me started in that area with that book marketing to the affluent, you know, mm -hmm. I wish I kept a copy of it. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, it was like, Oh, I read through it. I was called, wow, are you kidding me? This is how these people really think they, they don't live in big houses and they don't spend lots of money. They're frugal, frugal, frugal. Mm -hmm. And that's who they are. Right. That, that book certainly was the precursor to the millionaire next door. And of course, richer than a millionaire. So it's, um, it laid the found work, the foundation for what came next. Yeah, it, it's a, and then you, 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 your, your authors gave you a different name, and then you gave it a different name to so don't use it. Right, right. So, uh, the millionaire next door, before it became that title, was known as Big Hat No Cattle. Big Hat and, No Cattle. And our editor said, "Boys, nobody's going to buy that." <laughs> right. Yeah. Big Hat No Cattle. He was absolutely right. Yeah, no, you're, you're, you're right. Actually, I was having dinner with a friend the other day and I told him about your book. He goes, oh, yeah, I love that book. It's the greatest thing in the world. Everybody should read it, but they don't. And uh, that's the reason I, I said it should be required reading in every mm -hmm. school in America. And with that, somebody who may or may not have read the book, who's a CPA who's joined us, he's uh, Lee Newton Rhodes. You know. Good morning. Nick, just for our audience, can you explain the logic behind taxing that state that was already taxed when the person earned the money. Yeah, we'll see. see, yeah. see we'll, we'll get we'll get into the myth of that because that, to me that was the argument that was created. It's for goozy, you know. Uh, the fact is that if you make money uh, and you buy property, you pay property taxes. So oh, you paid taxes twice. Oh, <laughs> come on, come on. You know, it, it's kind of like the myth out there to get rid of the federal estate tax. But we'll get into that later on. See, I have my own opinion about that because I got started in the area and I got started actually in the 70s because my grandmother had a large estate. We were one of the founders of Bank One, which became Chase Bank. And my parents showed me and said, we got a big problem. What's that? We're going to pay a huge federal estate tax. 
And I was looking, <gasps> you know, my grandmother's rich, got to do something about it. So I got involved in the state plan years ago in the 70s, reducing them through just gifting strategies. In other words, there's little strategies you can do. To but there's a gift tax also, is there not? Yeah, but there's a, there's a, under 2053 of the Internal Revenue Code, you had an annual exclusion exemption. And then the gift tax exclusion also equals the federal estate tax exclusion. So you can actually use your unified credit earlier. So that's kind of how I got involved in it. Uh, and then I thought, wow, I, you know, we're, we're rich, we're multimillionaires. Then I went to the University of Miami and I was going to school with uh, Stu Miller. Uh, and his dad was a billionaire. And I was real, he, they own the Leonard Corporation, Leonard Miller. And I was realized, I'm poor, I'm poor. So the minute you want to, you feel rich, go hang around billionaires. Now you're poor. Now with that, some guy who deals not millions, but trillions, of course, government wasteful spending, which is the big argument, I think, against the Federalists paying a federal state tax is the Honorable David M. Walker. Uh, well, welcome to your show, David. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm yelling and screaming about the estate tax because... I basically got pink slipped um, in year 2001 with EGTRA. I left the estate tax planning area because they were limiting the estate tax. And my clients, one by one, fired me. Big name clients, the founder of Dunkin' Donuts, the, the chairman of Philip Morris, the president of Bausch & Loan, the president of Kimberly Clark. I got phone calls, you know, every month saying, we don't need an estate planning attorney, tax attorney, because there's no estate tax. And I realized at that point in time, and this is Egtra in 2001, where they eliminated the estate tax effective in 2010, I had to get another job. Uh, you know, there, there was going to be no estate tax planning anymore. So I got into pensions and I've been there ever since. So that's kind of the, the morph I did after 17 years in planning estates because it was known as the voluntary tax. If you plan properly, you can avoid it. If you don't, you pay it. I mean, that's kind of like the, the way it is and probably the way it is today. But now they get a, they, they get a free pass until you go over 23 million. Bring our last commentator in from Canada who doesn't have an axe to grind in this area, uh, Sasha Starr. Uh, who, uh, lucky. But we'll start with you, David, because um, you said you knew the guy who sold the bill of goods to the American public that rich people like myself should not pay taxes. Uh, tell us why that's a good thing. Well, for, let, let, let's let's provide some contextual sophistication, which is highly unusual when you're dealing with policy and political issues. Coming back to a few things that you said, if you look at our financial condition and fiscal outlook, um, our debt to GDP, I'm talking about total debt subject to the debt, debt ceiling is at all all time highs and going up rapidly. If you look at uh, if you look at the percentage of revenues, uh, pardon me, the amount of revenues we get as a percentage of GDP, it is below average post-World War II. If you look at the amount of spending as a percentage of GDP, it is significantly above average and going up rapidly. So therefore, the gap between revenues and expenditures is great already, and it's increasing over time. If you look at, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the uh, dispersion uh, in income and wealth in the country, in particular wealth, uh, it has grown dramatically. Uh, and uh, if you also recognize that there are several forms of taxation, there's payroll taxes, which are very regressive. You pay on the first dollar of earned income that you make. All right. Uh, there's income taxes, uh, there's, you know, property taxes, there's sales taxes, and, and you, know, you know, there's also the estate tax, which is the thing we're talking about today. Let's start by understanding that we have a huge gap in our finances. We've got a growing gap between the haves and the have-nots. We've got to have more revenues as a percentage of GDP. The question is, how do you get those revenues? Some people argue, well, let's adopt pro-growth policies. Well, I'm all for that, but there's no way you're going to solve this problem through growth. The math doesn't come close to working. And so we can talk about the estate tax, but let's understand that the, the people who are paying the estate tax, as was mentioned by Rick, 
what, one in 500? I don't have that number, but I'm assuming you're right on that, Rick. If, if one in 500 families are paying that, okay, and it used to be one in 100, uh, we can debate whether or not we ought to have an estate tax or what it ought to be. But one of the things we can say for sure is the people who are very well off in this country arguably have not paid their fair share in taxes that got us to the point that we are, which is getting worse going forward. And so let's talk about the estate tax. Right now, it doesn't affect that many people because the exemption is 12.9 million per person. So if you got a couple, double that, all right? There's still ways to plan around it. You know, as you know, Nick, there's still planning mechanisms, you know, intergenerational trusts and things of that nature that you can do. But a vast majority of people aren't, aren't going to be affected by it. But on the other hand, as of under current law, after 2025, it's supposed to go back to about, what, 6.4 million? All right. You know, that's, you know, most people still won't be affected by it, but that's a lot less. I mean, that's basically less than half of what it is right now. And I know in the past, the people that were most concerned about it were people who had a lot of their wealth tied up in non-readily marketable items such as farms, family farms, closely held businesses, et cetera. I mean, those were the ones that people were the most concerned about because it forced them to have to dispose of things in many cases that may have been in their families for generations. Uh, so so bottom line is let's, let's talk about the estate tax. It doesn't affect that many people. It's going to affect more when the exemption goes back uh, in 2026. Uh, if, if, if that's allowed to expire. Uh, but I'd be interested in hearing some other views about the pros and cons of the estate tax, but understand this. we got to raise more revenues. So if you don't want to do the estate tax, what do you want to do? You want to have a wealth tax with a much higher exemption, and there are challenges associated with administering that, and other countries have tried that. You want to raise tax rates on income taxes? You want to have a consumption tax? Do you want to have a value-added tax that you know that, that gears more towards the wealthy? But doing nothing, not an option. Huh. Bill, I see you shaking your head, my man. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, David, what about spending less? Oh yeah, I'm all for that. <laughs> the, right. pro the problem, in my opinion, Bill, if you look at the gap between projected spending and projected revenues. The problem is two to three to one, and I would say three to one now. Three to one spending to revenue. So there's absolutely no question the problem is primarily a spending problem. We have to reform social insurance programs to make them solvent, and sustainable, secure. There'll be some revenues associated with that, but much more in projected spending reductions than revenues, okay? Mm -hmm. We gotta reprioritize and reduce projected spending for discretionary spending, including defense. There's a lot of waste in defense, okay, uh, despite assertions by some to the contrary. But even after we do that, we're still going to have to have more revenues because mm -hmm. the, the hole is too deep, the gap is too great, we've waited too long. Yeah, but, but th this goes back to my theory, David, to make this country solvent again, you have to increase revenues decrease expenditures and basically do both to get yeah. to be, and, and the question is the question is the ratio it's right. much more geared towards spending than revenues all Correct. right and how do you raise the revenues right in a way that is pro growth enforceable and yeah. equitable right well well the thing is in, increasing revenues is important decreasing expenses are important got to do both and both of them are unpopular. Now, part of the reason uh, I'm in favor of the estate tax and being a beneficiary of not having to pay estate taxes is I feel like this is like an unbelievable windfall. There was no income taxes paid. You get a step up in basis in all the properties my parents bought, okay? And all of a sudden, poof, me and my brothers and sisters all, it rains money, you won the lottery. OK, and you don't pay a dime where when I go to work, it's a whole different story. Hmm. They collect 15.3 percent right up front in Social Security, and Medicare taxes. 
Then I got to pay a state income tax because I live in North Carolina. Then I got to pay a federal income tax. So I'm beaten up like crazy for working. But as an inheritor, I'm given a free pass. So what are we telling our kids? It's better to inherit money than to work for it. That's the message that they're, that I was given when I was a child. And they're right. Uh, you know, uh, being gifted money with, is great because you pay no gift taxes on it because you have your annual exclusion gifts. So there's a free pass. Now, whether if, if, if your job is to say, well, we like our wealthy people, you know, to maintain their wealth, just like uh, in Europe, they love their royals and we like our rich royalty, then that's fine. That's the And we don't like the working class. That's a whole different story. But if America is supposed to be a work, to supposed to support work, then you really should lower those taxes and increase the federal estate tax. And no, I didn't pay taxes twice on it. I paid no taxes on it, guys. You know, and, and I'm not the only one that inherited money that says that. If you spend a lot of time with people like I do that inherited money, they all say the same thing. They go, this is unbelievable. We just get a free pass. And then, frankly, some of my clients, they said, well, I got 20 million. OK, the estate tax is 10. My kids each get 5 million. I'm not going to do any planning. I'll just pay the 10 million. And, so, and I said, hey, why are you going to do that? We could do some planning. He goes, they each get 5 million, Nick. Uh, that's a pretty good chunk of change, isn't it? What am I supposed to do? Argue with them? No, he he went ahead and paid the ten million dollars. He didn't give a rat's rear. But I'd like to hear other people's thoughts. Old people own everything. People older than fifty eight have two thirds of the private wealth in this country. People less than forty three years old have six percent of private assets. And right now, the the U.S. expected life expectancy is is only about 78 or 79 because of COVID and opioids, but that's going to go up into the 80s and by the 2040s into the 90s. So old people will continue to own everything and they're not going to die. So it's it's a problem. Well, uh, Rick, we use the word seasoned here, not old. And uh, <laughs> secondly, secondly, you know, eventually they will die. I can assure you. Okay. The question is what happens after they die, but yeah. Well, I like the billionaire next door. Like I drive a crappy car with the bumper falling off and I'm saving my money to buy new organs in my eighties. <laughs> you know, all the tech billionaires are doing really weird stuff to try to live forever. And, you know, they won't live forever, but, uh, but people a with a ton of money will keep on living for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. And and in my personal case, one grandmother lived to 101 and the rich grandmother lived to, they're both wealthy actually, because my other one had real estate in downtown Tampa. One lived to 101, one lived to 99. And when I was a kid, I was going, well, all the money is trapped in older generations waiting to croak. And in my case, they didn't, do that until they yeah, yeah. By the time yeah. you inherit the money, you're in your 60s and you can't exactly. do the, the fun stuff that you could have done if you had it in your 40s. Right. But I'd like to hear from Bill because uh, he wrote that book that uh, changed my, my, my mind on how millionaires really thought, uh, the, the millionaire next door. And let's hear it from Bill. Well, well, certainly one of the uh, priorities of a responsible millionaire family is to have responsible children. And one of the ways to make them responsible is to give them a work ethic. So even if they do have an inheritance, you want to have them productive like yourself, Nick. I mean, you have the inheritance and you're still productive. Um, so far, so good with my three children. They're all pretty productive, very productive, good careers. And um, yeah, they will get an inheritance, but it's not going to affect their life, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and I don't yeah. want it to affect it. I want them to have their children to be able to do well as well. And, but in sociology, we know that money can deaden your senses. Mm. <laughs> it can uh, make you less productive. But if you bring that good work ethic into the mix, you know, money will certainly enhance your uh, capabilities. Right. Yeah. But shouldn't the tax system reward working right now to me? The way the tax system, it's upside down. It, if you're a working stiff, you get stiff the worst. If you have capital gains, it's better. Or mm -hmm. deferred capital gains, it's even better. In other words, mm -hmm. it's better. Uh, my, 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 my son who invested in real estate 
as, as last couple of years had at least a quarter, maybe 500,000 in unrealized capital gains. Okay. No taxes on it. It's just appreciation of some of the assets. Uh -huh. But when he works, he pays huge amounts of taxes, state income tax, federal income tax, social security, Medicare tax. It's almost like if you, if you're working for a living, you're punished. If you work less and you invest properly, you're less punished. If you inherit money, you're way even better off. Shouldn't the system be different? In other words, that we reward working people first and inheritors, inheritors the least. Anyway, what's your thoughts on that, Bill? Possibly. <laughs> I can uh, um, look, you know, right now we have some immediate pain, like in the great state of New York, we have this influx coming into New York City of, you know, migrants who need help. And the mayor of New York City has already said, look, uh, all agencies, you're going to do at least a five to 15 percent reduction in your current bu budget. And I know Governor Hochul is probably going to recognize we need more taxes in New York State to support this. And it becomes a question of what do we want in a society? Maybe it's right that we should, you know, welcome all these additional people into our society. Maybe it is our obligation to support them. Maybe we have to change all our lifestyles. But boy, it's going to hurt. I don't like yeah. all this transition that we're going through right now. But. I'm not going to have to live with it for too many more years. Yeah. Well, well, well should also the federal estate tax be earmarked to pay down the national debt? In other words, I think you would see more because one thing talking to my wealthy clients, they're really concerned about the spending problem in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. which hasn't stopped, obviously. But but in the estate tax, they really didn't care that much because they go, I'm dead. Why do I care? OK, mm -hmm. if we earmark those funds to pay down the national debt then that might be a more palatable solution uh, to that. And they, and they do, they do have the funds and the rates were high. Well, but I, I think there was a study, I don't, I don't recall the details, but they said, even if we taxed everybody's net worth to a hundred percent, you still yeah. wouldn't have enough money to pay off the debt. So, right. There has right. To be well, well, well you, you have to start, you have to start somewhere. In other words, you have to start somewhere you have to raise revenues. State taxes are one place to raise revenue. And you got to get rid of some of this crazy spending they do. Every time I see a bill, they spend $60 million, billion on this, $70 billion on that, stuff they don't have to spend the money on. Yes, David. Well, Nick, first, what I want to do is reinforce what Bill said to congratulate you for not being spoiled because of inherited a lot, inheriting a lot of money. And you are obviously a very productive person. And, and, uh, and if you didn't inherit the money, you know, you, you would have done very well anyway. But the bottom line is you didn't let it affect you. Too many people do. And there's mm -hmm. all kinds of stats where, you know, people that inherit a lot of money, you look out, you know, two generations later and a lot of the money is gone. Mm -hmm. You know, I've heard these sayings before by a number of people, including a former billionaire who you, I, I used to work for who said, you, you know, you want to leave your kids enough money where they can do what they want, but not enough when they can do nothing. And the second thing that he used to say is you have to know the meaning of the word enough. Once you have enough, then you, you shouldn't be striving to get more and you should be figuring out how you can make a difference uh, in the world you know, with your money and with your time and, and, and elsewhere. So, look, I, I think the issue is this. We need to generate more revenues. We've got a growing gap between the haves and the have nots, especially with regard to wealth. I agree with you that our tax policy should should reward work. OK, which is one of the reasons that you don't want to end up raising payroll taxes, which are the most regressive taxes at all. Many economists believe that the most you know, that, that the best tax is a progressive consumption tax and that, in fact, that you should eliminate other forms of taxation and just go to a progressive consumption tax uh, with an exemption from having to pay that tax at some level, you know, so the poverty level or some function of the poverty level. So uh, so you deal with that issue. Uh, but part of the issue is what do you do with the fact that you've got, let's say, the one percent of families that that Rick said, OK, uh, well, it's less than that. So, you know, uh, less than 1%. It's two-tenths of 1%. The two-tenths the two of 1% of families 
who have accumulated huge amounts of money right. that they didn't pay taxes on, or if they did, it was a small fraction of it. Okay. What do you do with that? And that really comes back to, should they have to, for the benefit of society, because of our huge, you know, unfunded obligations, because of uh, our growing gap uh, in finances, should they have to pay something because of having the opportunity to accumulate that amount of money in this in this in this country? And should that be through an estate tax with maybe a higher exemption, or should that be through a wealth tax, which would be imposed every year for amounts in excess of a certain amount of money? Because I don't think you're going to get it. I mean, I don't. I don't think anybody wants to go back to where we have marginal income tax rates at 80, 90 percent. I mean, I don't think anybody wants to do that, right? I mean, uh, uh, then, then that has other adverse effects. So, how best to deal with this? And then I'll come back after we hear a little bit more from people about some of the things that the American people said they thought we ought to be doing in the tax area, based upon. My, my 2012 10,000 mile, 27 state fiscal responsibility bus tour that was funded largely by H. Ross Perot Sr. May, may, may God rest his soul, but Rick's got his hand up. So I read a lot of near future science fiction and in most of it, none of these problems have been solved and rich people who are even more rich, say 10, 20 years from now in science, they live in, walled fortress communities, well guarded by private security. Hmm. And then the rest of the country has just gone to crap. <laughs> well, there's some places that have already. Have you ever been to Boca Raton, Florida? Oh, I, yeah. I, okay, I used to live in Boca. And, and, and the funny thing about Boca, uh, it's where in Boca. And so when I first moved there, I got a small place in Boca, Fontana. It was always where in Boca. And I said, well, I live in Boca, Fontana. They literally stick your nose up. And I was going, I'm getting really tired of this. So I went to the wealthiest community, which is St. Andrew's Country Club. And I bought a house there. Then I, then the conversation, where you live in, in Boca? I live in St. Andrew's Country Club. All bets off. They're all quiet. Because they're all like, you know, huge million dollar plus homes and stuff like that. It's, it's very strange. But in Boca, they already are like that. The communities are all gated like St. Andrew's, secured. And, and I don't know if they keep the people out or maybe it seemed better to keep those people inside and not let them out. Let, let me <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not really sure about that. Uh, let let me mention real quick my experience with Boca. I lived one summer in Boca Raton in the St. Andrews Boys School. So oh. the dorms in the St. Andrews Boys School when I worked for the Miami Dolphins. That's where we had summer training camp. And, and let me say, it looks like the Dolphins may be pretty good this year. So it's about time. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so anyway, they, they, they actually do have that. Um, and it's surprising when I left Boca to find out the law of the wealthy communities aren't gated. I thought everybody lived in gated communities, <laughs> you know, but my wife said, we got to get out of Boca. I said, why that? Because our kids are growing up in fantasy land. They got to see what the real world's like. Yeah. So we left, we left Boca. And it is a bit of a fantasy world, but it does exist right now, you know, in certain uh, communities. But uh, going back to the federal estate tax, the reason why I'm pro tax, besides losing my job as an estate tax attorney, is frankly, when the money changes hands when people die, okay, and I've, I've been down that road before, the the individuals that collect it are grateful they receive anything. And if even if they had to pay a small tax, a 10%, you can broaden the base, make the estate tax 10% at the first dollar you get because it's a windfall for every inheritor. You know, it, it really is. In other words, all of a sudden they're going like, wow, look at all this money I got. And if you had to pay 10% to the federal government, you go, shrug, you shrug your shoulders, so what? It's still a lot of money. Hmm. And it doesn't hurt the guy who made it because they're dead. Uh, you know? yeah. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I'd like to hear from Bill on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, let's look at a couple of public statements of some very wealthy individuals. I remember a a, a Forbes magazine interview uh, with um, uh, Bill Gates, and he was asked how much money he's going to give his children. And he said, I'm only going to give them $5 million each. I don't want to spoil them. And, you know, so and he also, along with his buddy uh, Warren Buffett, they've taken that pledge to be charitable, you know, 
only retain you know, a few hundred million for themselves, but give away the billions during their lifetime. And they're living yeah. up to that. that yeah, but, 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 but also the part of the reason why they do that is they're above the 23 million. And then there's a big federal estate tax. Yeah. One way right. to get out of federal estate tax is to create a private foundation. Right. And contribute all your money to the private foundation upon death. So a lot of it is tax motivated. My question, and this we'll never know the answer, if they eliminated the estate tax altogether, would these private foundations exist at the hmm. size and scope that they do? Yeah. And I'm not sure if they would, because uh, I knew the attorney that worked with Bill Gates when I lived in Seattle, and and I'm pretty sure the the estate tax he was he was looking at because you know 55 percent on billions of dollars is a huge amount of money. And as he said, which is quite true, I don't have that money. It's all in Microsoft stock. Big problem with all these billionaires, if you spend time with them, they can't, they don't have the money. It's yeah. the value of their stock once it's sold. And if they die and they had to sell it, huge reduction in the value. Yeah. So so uh, oddly um, enough, the billionaires, um, yeah. they can't pay the tax. <laughs> yeah, know, they, well, yeah. They don't have Some the of these foundations, you know, like Rockefeller <laughs> live on into perpetuity and they've really changed yeah. their, uh, sure. their their values. Uh, not necessarily for the better, but I think uh, Gates, the foundation, I said, we're going to, it'll last 50 years after the death of the founders. You know, right. Th th there's a sunset on there. Yeah. So they're going to get the money into society one way or the other within that, with that time frame. So the person yeah. I was talking about was Pete Peterson. Yeah. Uh, and Pete was, you know, was good friends with, uh, Warren Buffett, among others, and he took the pledge that that he would uh, give half of his money to charity. It's half, is what they said. Mm -hmm. So when he when he uh, hit the jackpot when Blackstone went public, uh, he made two billion dollars, and he committed a billion dollars to set up a private foundation, okay, which he did, which is the Peter G. Peterson Foundation, and I was the first CEO of that. Uh, and you're right. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I, I think you wouldn't have uh, as many of these unless you had a carve out. In fact, that comes back to something that I said before. When I talked to the American people back in 2012 about what kind of tax reform should we be considering on, on the income tax, they said several things. One, we have too many people paying no income tax. Uh, you know, in any given year, it's 40 to 50 percent of people who file a tax return pay zero income tax uh, and 20 percent roughly get a rebate through the earned income tax credit, you know, refundable tax, child care tax credits, et cetera. Right. So the first thing they said is we got to have more people paying something, you know, you know, when you're above the poverty level or some function of the poverty level, somebody needs to pay something. OK. At the same point in time, the wealthy need to pay a higher percentage, uh, you know, but 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 we don't want to be too high. But the real problem was the, the tax deductions, exemptions, credits and exclusions uh, that we've got one point seven trillion dollars worth of lost revenues because deductions, exemptions, uh, credits and exclusions and the wealthy benefit from that disproportionately. All right. And so let's streamline and simplify the tax code to where we eliminate a vast majority of those. Yeah, you can have a standard deduction. You can have one for kids. But I'm talking about other ones, all right, uh, and exclusions. And uh, some of the things they said were, okay, the, the three deductions that you want to keep uh, are de deductions uh, for home mortgage up to a reasonable level. So let's say the value of the conforming loan, which varies by region of the country, all right, but nowhere is a million dollars, okay? Secondly, and not nothing for second homes, nothing for second homes, all right? Secondly, charitable contributions, which you can say if you set up a private foundation, that's, you know, that, that's a charitable contribution. Mm -hmm. Full deductibility for charitable contributions because you got to keep in mind the government's going to be doing less and therefore we will need for charitable institutions to do more. Because the government's going to do less. Because we got to cut spending big time. Uh, and then thirdly, retirement savings. You know that we we need to encourage people to save for retirement, uh, and, and 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 that's a legitimate thing. And then, you know, and then we said, okay, so we're going to recapture a lot of revenues, 
because we're going to eliminate the, a lot of deductions, exemptions, credits, and exclusions. But we want to encourage those three things. Uh, and then the question is, well, what do you do with the people who are super wealthy already? Hmm. And I think you only have two choices. The choices are you either have an estate tax or you have a wealth tax. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and what's wrong with a broad base federal estate tax? I mean, let, let, let's say I go, well, I'm going to die and I like Rick Rosner. So I give him a hundred thousand. I give Dave a hundred thousand, give a uh, bill a hundred thousand. Okay. And under the current situation, you'd all receive the money and pay zero taxes. You know, is that a right thing to do? Shouldn't you pay at least 10%? Because remember, we still have that big national debt. What is wrong with a broad base federal estate tax? Because it's a windfall for anybody who receives it. But go on, Rick. That's you my... can't implement any of these potential solutions until you reduce the power of lunatics in national government. <laughs> a normal House of Representatives passes three to 600 laws in two years. The current House of Representatives in eight months has passed 13 laws because they're, they're busy doing nonsense. And so we've got all these potential solutions we're talking about. Nothing can get implemented until the government gets less broken. Yeah, well, well see, my thinking should be earmarked to reduce the federal debt. But at the same time, it seems to me, David, they still have a problem because your friend Joe Biden it is not the debt, it's the deficit. He's spending He's spending more, he's taken into the tune of $1.5 trillion or $1.7 trillion. So we still have a spending problem. You got to work on that side of the ledger. And the real problem is both sides of the ledger are unpopular. Making people pay more taxes, not popular. Making people not just spend like a drunken sailor, not popular. So unfortunately, if you're going to run the government right, you need somebody who's elected who's frankly not popular. And, and well, then maybe we'll have some fiscal responsibility. But that's why you need two but things. Isn't there an argument? And I'll continue to say. Number one, you need a constitutional amendment that limits how much debt as a percentage of the econ economy this country can take on and sets a lower target for us to get to within a period of time. All right. Only constitutional provisions can constrain current and future Congresses. Statutory limits such as the debt ceiling will not stand the test of time and they fail over and over and over again. Right. Secondly, if you think that Congress is going to make the tough choices on taxes and spending and social insurance reforms through the regular order, uh, that's never going to happen. OK, uh, you know, people want to pay as little taxes as possible and get as much benefits as possible. People don't you know, most elected officials don't care about stewardship anymore. All right. Uh, and, and that's why people are so ticked off that, you know, they think that the country's headed in the wrong direction and that the future for their kids and grandkids is not as going to be as good as it was for them, uh, which is downright un-American. So you have to have a special mechanism. And that special mechanism is a statutory commission comprised of capable, credible and non-conflicted people uh, who aren't sitting politicians, at least a, a majority or not who will gauge the public with the facts of truth, tough choices, solicit input, make a package of recommendations dealing with the budget process, revenues, social insurance, discretionary spending that gets a guaranteed vote in Congress. So, you know, you till the ground, you set the table for a tough vote uh, because the people are a lot smarter than the politicians. I mean, you know, they know we've got to do something and they'll accept something as long as it's as an appropriate goal, consistent with principles and values that bring people together rather than divide them apart. And I'm happy to talk about those principles and values that got 95% support. The, the, the news channels are divisive. The Fox, MSNBC, next. CNN, they, they generate the distrust and polarization. Yeah, they're a big part of the problem, Steve, uh, you know, because people self-select where they want to get their information from. And by the way, it isn't news. You know, it's opinion. A vast majority of what you see on TV today is not news. It's opinion. Steve? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Steve. I can't stay long. I welcome the It's always great to be here. But isn't there an argument to be made that even though things are really bad for the U.S. from a debt perspective, 
that we just can print more money and so we just basically get out of it all the time. I mean, even though things have been really bad, I mean, a devil's advocate, well, we're still got manufacturing jobs come in. Inflation's coming down, even though it's still higher than it was. Um, does that, does it eventually, and I guess my question is for David, does the economics just eventually keep up, you know, catch up with you, right? That you just can't incur. Because I think that's the problem is we have these debts, then they threaten government shutdown. Everything is normal. Still the economy, the United States today is still the best economy in the world. I mean, we're doing, we, we, we always manage to survive the crisis. But in, is that bad that we keep doing that? Well, well, one, we're not the best economy in the world. There's a number of economies that are stronger than ours, including Switzerland, uh, in a much better financial condition than we are, and their currency is so, more solid. But, um, but you know, look, look, you know, the more you spend, the more you increase the money supply, the higher inflation goes. There's no free lunch, okay? Inflation, frankly, is the cruelest tax of all. You know, if we look at what's happened, you know, in the last two and a half years, you know, people are behind 5%. You know, the, the value of wage increases versus inflation, it's down 5%. We're still, you know, 1.7% above the target rate for inflation. Uh, and, 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 you know, it may be going up some more because of energy prices. Our energy policy is done a 180. Uh, uh, so so I, I think bottom line is we got a serious problem. We're going to have to make, we're going to have to make tough choices. Um, and the people say that people are not happy. I mean, the, and by the way, the people aren't happy for either uh, with uh, they aren't happy with either potential presidential candidate either. I, I think so, we're I think we're spoiled because still after world after World War II, the U.S. owned the world. We had ninety percent of manufacturing capacity because the rest of the world was in ruins, and. We still for 20, 30, 40 years, you know, we've had this huge advantage, and now we have to become more competitive and it's tough to adjust. Also, we're a huge lumbering battleship of a country, the, the country with the most economic freedom, according to the Heritage Foundation, is Singapore. Singapore is like what 20 square miles, maybe less. And it's a dictatorship, and everybody's happy because everybody's rich as heck in Singapore. <laughs> it's true. And, and then I found out that Ireland actually has a budget surplus, and they have money in reserves. North Carolina, where I live, actually has a budget surplus and money in reserve. Some states are actually fiscally sound. If you look at the United States of America, it's fiscally sick. It's not sound. And and it's not getting any better. Yes. It's, it looks like it's uh, a. Well, I would say that West Virginia is cutting their budget seventy five million. West Virginia is cutting their budget seventy five million. They're going to have to close down the universities and the programs, and it's crazy. So, and yeah. from what I understand, Florida has the highest inflation. Yeah, um, it, could, uh, yeah. it could be, but but Florida is more fiscally. So the states are more fiscally sound than the federal so, government right now, which is so really. Be, my question is how, in terms of economics wise, um, for example, even the, the topic of inflation, we seem to be so, uh, I guess, uh, we tend to ignore the world on the whole inflation issue, that inflation hit everywhere globally. Um, and we seem to be doing better than many other countries inflation wise. How do we, and that, that goes economic wise for many other areas in our economics. So how do we educate the public itself to a point that not only to stop the idea that we have to be the standalone entity in a global economy in terms of, well, what happens here only happens here and anything that happens elsewhere, yeah, I don't even care about, even though Inflation, for example, supply chain issues, uh, uh, just a whole bunch of things that affect our economy that we have no control over. So how do we educate the public in that light to stop thinking, pigeonholing everything to a point to where we can't appreciate some of the things that have been accomplished? We have to be able to understand that on every major issue, you have to educate people on three things to know how you're doing. How are you doing compared to plan 
Now, here's the problem with the U.S. No plan. There's no plan. All right. Number uh, number two, are you getting better or worse? And then number three, which you're raising appropriately, is how do you compare to others? If you don't know all three of those things, you really don't know how, what, how you're doing. At the same point in time, we have a disproportionate obligation to lead because we have the world's largest reserve currency. And if yeah. the U.S. gets a cold, the world gets a flu. Uh, and, and, and we're not leading by example right now. And some of our policies are complicating the situation. For example, our energy and environment policy. Look, I believe in climate change, and I believe that man has something to do with it. But the fact is, is that we're totally unrealistic about how quickly we're going to be able to hit some of these goals. And we've dramatically changed our energy production policy domestically. We've drained our strategic petroleum reserve to, to the lowest level it's ever been, okay? Uh, and, uh, and, you know, when, when in reality, we could be doing things that would have, that would bring energy prices down for us significantly, have a better glide path and a more realistic glide path to all, to all other alternative energy sources and help our allies be less reliant on unfriendly nations, you know, such as Russia, such as Venezuela and such as Iran, you know, for energy supplies. So, yeah, you're right. How are you doing compared to plan? We have no plan. Are we getting better or worse on inflation? We're, we're getting better until the last two months. It went up the last two months. And energy policy is our primary problem there. It's our primary problem. Uh, and then thirdly, how do we compare to others? That's totally legitimate. And, you know, in, in many cases, we weren't as bad as some others. But we weren't uh, we weren't the best. Well, and then also to touch on, you know, something about that, uh, you know, in terms of the honesty, when can we be honest? We are we are an ever growing old nation. Our, our our services and everything are ballooning because of that. And we seem to avoid the the the, the ideas or the understanding that, you know, we have an elderly nation that needs to be taken care of, or are we just going to go ahead and just cut these these uh, safety nets to to a point where uh, individuals will not have anything in their golden years and will not be taken care of? And I understand the whole charity thing, but I'm just fearful that you know the charities become a shell company. How many in the upper echelon will create? A shell company, a, a charity, have people donate to it, and then okay, that money disappears, but doesn't help my family, or doesn't help neighbor's family, or doesn't help me as I get older. So, how do we create a, I, I, I guess, a balance, more so? Well, for, of, first, you know, not only charitable organizations, but also government entity to help an elderly nation that's only getting older. Yeah, we're an aging society, but we're not nearly aging as rapidly as some others, such as uh, Japan. OK, uh, we we have a birth rate of about two, which is not. Which is not adequate to sustain the population. Therefore, we have to rely on immigration in order to grow the population. But there's a difference between legal immigration and illegal immigration. And there's a difference between having immigration policies that are designed to promote economic growth and opportunity versus to draw upon social services uh, disproportionately, whether it be at the federal, state or, or local level. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, it, this is a solvable problem. OK, I mean, you know, our challenges are solvable with leadership, and that's the biggest deficit that we have. Everybody's living for today rather than taking steps to help create a better tomorrow. And to help create a better tomorrow, it means more selective investment, less consumption. It means, you know, getting control of spending uh, and it means raising more revenues. That's what we're going to have to do. I agree with David that educating people about, well, expectations 
is he, my wife and I have been in couples counseling for 30 years because I have good insurance that will pay for it. And part of couples counseling is working with each other to give each other reasonable expectations. And the U.S. Has, be, has become, and probably the rest of the world, and largely thanks to social media, we're very much more selfish and self-oriented than, say, the World War II generation. They made incredible sacrifices, including dying, rationing, a lot of stuff that we that people would call communism. Because what I can't buy as much gas and meat, I have to turn in scrap metal, and pe people need to be, if you go out, you know, since COVID, like you go out in traffic, you go out in public and people are bigger dicks than ever. And it's a challenge to make people less dickish. Well, also, I mean, I guess on that and not really less dickish, but I mean, just more understanding, empathetic. Um, and I think, uh, for example, I don't know, I, I guess, you guys may have talked about the strike that's going on with the the A A W U. Well, U A W. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, U -A -W. even the understanding of their plight of what they're arguing about. The same thing. The plight that's happening here uh, because we have a union. Well, a union strike that just ended, but that's about to start again because they did not. Uh, it was the sanitation workers here in in, in North Carolina or in Durham, uh, but they didn't they didn't uh, like the actual um uh the 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 deal that was put before them but one of the big thing the problem in terms of that empathy and understanding and less dickish um and trying to understand somebody else's plight uh and being again always that balance it, it it's tough to one of the things that we always have stuck in our head is that these individuals aren't smart enough, so they cannot do something else. At some point, how do we get past that? How do we get past that? This sanitation worker who decided that that was the profession that they wanted to go into is just as brilliant, is just as hardworking as the individual who is on the stock market, but making millions. So I don't know how, how can we get past that? Because I think that could also help economically. You know, Jatevi, you know, with the UAW strike, there's a company out of Lakeland, Florida, that I knew their family. It's the Jenkins family. Uh, some people around the country may not heard it, but there's a grocery store called Publix. It is, go look at Google it. It is the right. second best rated grocery store in the United States of America. It's also the largest ESOP, employee stock ownership program. When you walk into Publix supermarket, all those people that serve you are owners of Publix. It's owned by the employees. The UAW, and this always gets me about uh, the Midwest and the you know where Bill Denko lives. There's this stratification of, between owners and employees that should not exist. The employees should be owners through stock option programs like they did in Seattle, Washington, with Microsoft. Owners of the company. And for some reason, in the Midwest, the mighty Midwest, which we were told when I was a kid how great and wonderful General Motors Ford, they don't have stock ownership programs. It's ridiculous. Uh, where in Microsoft and all the all the tech companies, the owners they, they give the employees an ownership uh, stake in the company, and it could easily be solved by having an ESOP style, style program for the people at the UAW, and they don't do it. So I'm, I'm just going. I don't. I don't feel sorry for any of them. The the uh, between the employees and the owners uh, and the way they think in the mi mighty Midwest, they deserve to go down the toilet. And Tesla, of course, which doesn't even have a union, will probably take over the automobile. Well, bill. Also, I mean, part, their part plight of the is also there. part. Oh, I was just going to say real quick that their plight also is similar to the writer strike because their plight is still fighting against. But, but it's the the of AI and a whole bunch ownership. of stuff. Through stock options, you can solve all these problems, but they refuse to do yeah, it. My, yeah, there's, my, my, son, my son works for Google, and he gets he gets stock uh, options, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he gets stock as part of his company. Well, I mean, you know, there's a there's a big advocate for employee ownership. 
to a certain yeah. extent. They, they, they even have a, a group called but the does that Center. roll back to the education yeah. point? Because a lot of times some people don't see stock as me being able to go to the store and buy me some cereal. They, they need well, to our, learn. our education we, system we is not Echo's book. Rebuild Echo's book. <laughs> our education <laughs> system is not top 25 in the world. Yeah. All right. Mm-hmm. Not top 25. We don't educate people on financial literacy. We don't educate them on civic responsibility. We don't do enough with regard to helping people understand the value of the trades uh, and alternatives to going to college, you know, as Germany and other countries do. So we got a lot of we got a lot of work to do there. What happened with the UAW is that they had to give up a lot back in 2008, 2009, when we had the major financial problems in the country. The government gave the auto companies a ton of money, billions of dollars, all right? The, the workers had to end up not asking for wage increases. The workers yeah. had to end up giving up a defined benefit pension plan. They had yeah. to give up retiree health care. And so, uh, you know, the gap between the earnings of the CEO and the average worker has grown dramatically, which is something that's got to be looked at, no question. Uh, and I do think employee ownership is part of the answer. So now what the union's trying to do is they're trying to say, well, look, you know, we've given. Now what we want is we want we want our fair share, quote unquote, whatever that is. But they want a 40 percent pay increase. They want DB plan. They want retiree health care. They want a four day work week for five days of pay. They need to get something, but they're being totally unrealistic. Well, I think they're basing that 40 that 40 percent off of the CEO pay that jumped 40 percent. Well, well, my point is there's only one CEO metric. There's 100,000 workers, okay? I mean, do the math. But again, that's like that still goes back to the plight of saying that that worker doesn't work as hard as that CEO. In the old days, then you 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 make your employee feel devalued what they're doing. CEO pays out of control. Okay, like in the old right. days, CEOs made an average of 50 times what an employee makes. Right. Now it's 350 right. times. It, 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 and there's a book called The Psychopath Test about the rise of CEOs who are psychopaths and who are only serve to increase shareholder value. Yeah. In the olden days, you know, CEO in the you know CEOs were paternalistic and kind of knew their employees in the 1950s, and it's a whole new system now that's based on you know pumping up the stock price. Well, and in yeah, Germany, not doing, for example, Germany, yeah, not employees doing, have uh, seats market. on the board. Employees have seats on the right. board in Germany, and if you had an ESOP plan, ESOP, yep. If you had an ESOP plan, they'd be on the board. Right. They'd be on the board. I, I agree. Like they're, 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 not they're, they're not here, Steve. Steve. Please not giving a piece Steve. of the action. I'll be yeah, yeah, Steve. There you go. See you guys next week. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, we got we gotta wind up. We're at the hour. So we do want to thank our special guest. Uh, for uh, Bill Denko for showing up from the millionaire next door and uh, David Walker, the former Comptroller General of the United States and our panelists from around the United States. And we'll see you next week on and economics. And Canada. And Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Canada. Around, around the world, we will include Canada. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Walker. Thank you, guys. All the best. All the best.